In this video, we're going to look at the geometry of the complex numbers. So in the very first introductory video, I post two questions at the end of that, or really two lines, two paths of study in the immediate future. So we're going to explore the two of the following. So the first one we explored was what are the algebraic operations that we can do on the complex numbers? And we looked at complex addition and complex multiplication. And that was in the previous video about algebra of complex numbers. So what we're going to move on to is the second question, how the usual Euclidean distance function on R2, so between two points in the plane, how can we use that to measure the distances between two complex numbers? So that's what we're going to focus on for this video. So if I scroll down a little bit, we can think of a point x comma y in R2 as a vector. And so the length of that vector is going to be just the usual Euclidean distance from that point x comma y to the origin. Remember the origin is zero comma zero. So what am I saying to you in symbols? I'm gonna use this absolute, absolute value notation for length that's on the left side. So the length of x comma y, that vector, again, point vector, I'm using those interchangeably as synonyms. So the length of that vector is just the square root of, I take the difference of the x coordinates, quantity squared, plus the difference in the y coordinates, quantity squared. So x minus zero and y minus zero. Again, that's how far that point is from the origin. And there's a picture, oh my goodness. So that's how long that vector is from the origin to x comma y. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna define the absolute value of a complex number. Now sometimes that goes by the name of modulus, or some people just say the length as well. I think you'll hear modulus uh, more often in a complex analysis or complex variables textbook, but uh, you know in some textbooks they just say absolute value, and I'll probably say either of those, absolute value or modulus, uh, interchangeably as these videos progress. So the absolute value of a complex number is going to be find the exact same way. So I'll still use this absolute value notation. So that says absolute value of z. But what is it? It's just x squared plus y squared. I do the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared. And again, that's pretty consistent with how far away is that point from the origin. It's the same picture. And you remember, what's the relationship? The complex numbers, they look just like the plane in R2. It's just a matter of relabeling. And where the differences come in is some of the algebra that you do with i. Okie dokie. So that is how... Uh, let's see, that is the absolute value of a complex number. And so notice the absolute value of a complex number is real. It's a real number. Fantastic. Let's do an example. So let's say I've got this number 3 minus 2i, and I want to know what's it at, what absolute value it has. So I'm going to do 3 squared plus negative 2 quantity squared and, I, and take the square root of the results. And when you do that, you get 9 plus 4, and you should get the square root of 13. And so the square root of 13, again, you're thinking about it as, that's telling me that uh, 3 minus 2i is that many units away from complex 0, from 0 plus 0i. So square root of 13 units away. So we're still thinking about absolute value as measuring like a distance from 0, you know, just like it was for real numbers on the real number line. Kind of cool. All right, so let's define a new thing that's probably not so new, because this is probably not your first encounter ever with complex numbers. But the complex conjugate of x plus iy is x minus iy. And the notation, when you have a complex number z, the notation is z bar. So the element z bar denotes the complex conjugate of z. And uh, again, what's the punchline? You just take the imaginary part and you give it the opposite sign. And so what does that amount to in a picture geometrically? It's a reflection. It's some kind of a vertical reflection. When I say vertical reflection, I mean you're reflecting it over the real axis. So you see that uh, the pink point x plus iy reflects over to its conjugate x minus iy. All right, so some things to notice about z and z bar and how they play with each other with some of the algebra that I know how to do. So what's z times z bar? So I went ahead and I just wrote them out next to each other. And let's go ahead and FOIL. And the result of FOILing, of course, is going to be x squared plus y squared. And now notice again that that's a real number. So z times z bar will always give you back a real number. But then x squared plus y squared should look familiar. That looks an awful lot like what is underneath the square root in the definition of the absolute value of z. And so putting this all together, what is z times its conjugate? z times its conjugate is the modulus squared, or z times its conjugate is the absolute value squared. Now, the absolute value, again, is the distance. The absolute value of z is the distance from z to 0 plus 0i. Let's generalize that a little bit. So if I know how to measure the distance from z to the origin, can I measure the distance from z to some other point? And we sure can. So how do I generalize this to measure distance between a plus bi and c plus di? How does it depend on a, b, c, and d? 
And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna define a function where you input two complex numbers, z and w, and it outputs a real number. Then the real number output should be the distance between z and w. And how we should do it, we'll just take the absolute value of the complex number z minus w. And if you write out what does that look like, you remember z minus w, I would subtract the real parts, a minus c, and I'd subtract the imaginary parts, so b minus d. And I'm just gonna take the absolute value of this complex number. And remember that says to square the, square the real part plus square the imaginary part, and then take the square root of the result. And so here we go. And so again, what should that look an awful lot like? That is exactly the Euclidean distance function that you probably learned in like a, an algebra class or a college algebra class. You take the difference in the x coordinate squared plus the difference in the y coordinate squared. That's it. Exact same thing. We're just kind of repackaging it a little bit differently with complex numbers, but it's all the same stuff. So just to make sure we're crystal clear, right? D is a function where you input two complex numbers and it spits out a real number. So what if I input one plus i and two minus i? In that case, just how do I compute the distance between them? I would take one minus two quantity squared plus one minus negative one quantity squared. And so again, just to emphasize, I'm trying to put the real parts together and take their difference, trying to put the imaginary parts together and take their difference, square both of those. You should get one plus four here if you did that right. And then of course you get the square root of five. And so we just computed that one plus i and two minus i are the square root of five units apart from each other. And there's my little picture down there to denote that. What are some other fun facts that would be useful to know about the distance function in complex numbers? So some other fun facts. The real part of z is always gonna be between negative absolute value of z and positive absolute value of z. And a similar statement can be made with these inequalities regarding the imaginary part of z. And uh, what that kind of comes down to in a picture is you know, the um, absolute value of z, it's the hypotenuse of this triangle, and it's always gonna be the hypotenuse. Whereas the real part and the imaginary part are always gonna be the smaller legs. And I went ahead and just put absolute values of real and imaginary in there, you know, just to take care of maybe your triangles in the second quadrant or third quadrant, who knows, right? Anyway though, you're always gonna have this no matter where your triangle lives. So again, the, the absolute value of z is always gonna be the hypotenuse. All right, so the smaller legs are always gonna be, you know, less than that but then bigger than minus that. Great. What else? If What if I took z plus its conjugate? If you think about it, when I add them together, the imaginary parts would cancel. So you just get two times the real part left over. Whereas z minus its conjugate, if you think about it, the real parts would cancel. So then you should just get two times the imaginary part left over. And then also, of course, the, the you know, sign change there. And that might be good to write out on your own and make sure that that's working out. But anyway, pinky promise those formulas are correct. So why am I laying out these kind of obscure formulas here? It's because we're gonna try and prove a very important result that you've seen if you've had like real analysis or advanced calculus before, but uh, what are some things that I can, I can expect to do with the distance function? And so we need to talk about the triangle inequalities. And notice I'm saying inequalities, plural. I'm gonna tell you about two of them. So when you've got z1 and z2 that are complex numbers, the first one is, is kind of classically what the triangle inequality is. The absolute value of z1 plus z2 should be less than or equal to the absolute value of z1 plus the absolute value of z2. And the second one sometimes goes by the name of the reverse triangle inequality, but you'll encounter it enough too in this class that uh, we'll just put them together and call this batch the, uh, the whole, the, the batch of triangle inequalities, that's this theorem. Anyway, what's b say? Absolute value of z1 minus absolute value of z2 should be less than or equal to the absolute value of the difference. All right, so then these will be important for us later on when we start to talk about trying to do calculus and stuff with complex numbers, because these will give me uh, a, a tool in order to make some arguments about how close complex numbers are to each other and do things like limits and stuff like that. Okie dokie, so how do these proofs go? We haven't done any proofs yet in these complex videos. So for the first one, for the regular old triangle inequality, part A. So observe, things are usually easier when you work with the square. So let's look at the square of the absolute value of z1 plus z2. And remember, I had a property that says, oh, that's the same thing as z1 plus z2 times its modulus. And when you multiply that out, how does a modulus work? Sorry, before I multiply. A modulus is pretty nice. When you add two things together, or not a modulus, I'm sorry, conjugate. So z1 plus z2 times its conjugate. So the conjugate is pretty nice, where when you take the conjugate of a sum of two complex numbers, that's the conjugate of each one. So notice I just split that conjugation symbol. The bar goes over each of them. Now let's go ahead and FOIL that out. If you FOIL it out, I get this, and you all believe me about that, that's fantastic. In the next line, I'm gonna do something tricky. 
And the next line, the tricky thing that I did was I would really like the two things in the middle to kind of look like like terms or maybe to have similar symbols. So you notice in the third line, that's Z1, Z2 bar, and then the bar goes in the wrong spot. But what if I get crafty about this? So I'm gonna rewrite that third one, and I'm talking about third one as if you have any idea what I'm referring to. I am speaking about this one here. I'm gonna put an extra bar over the top. And I'm using a little property here that Z double bar is just equal to Z. And so that's convenient for me here. And the whole reason that I do that is kind of outlined in yellow. Oh, I start to see somebody and it's conjugate there. So I'm gonna take Z1, Z2 bar plus its conjugate. And I know a fact about what do you get when you add a, a, a complex number to its conjugate? You just get two times the real part. And so in that case, oops, sorry, I gotta get rid of this stuff. In that case, that's just equal to, again, all that happened in the middle was that stuff's equal to two times the real part of Z1, Z2 bar. Now, why is that nice? Because now I can use another property that tells me that this is less than or equal to two times the modulus of Z1 times Z2. And uh, why is that helpful for me? Why is that nice? So that's where I'm using the fact that the real part of a complex number is always smaller than or equal to uh, its modulus. And I am using modulus correctly here. Again, maybe I should just stick to absolute value. So it's always less than or equal to its absolute value. And uh, that part is nice for me here because here's where I get that less than or equal to, right? Making that leap, that's where we, we did that here to justify this less than or equal to. But then uh, in the next part, we can split this absolute value to each factor in this product here. And the absolute value of Z2 bar is the same thing as the absolute value of Z2. So like uh, a number and its conjugate have the same absolute value. You could see that in my picture too, if you allow me to scroll back up to where I graphed an absolute value, a complex number and its conjugate, uh, you see that they're both the same distance away from the origin. So again, how far apart they are from each other, that's the same distance, doesn't matter. I'm sorry, how far apart each of them are from the origin is the same, is of course what I meant to say. All right, go back to this proof. Where are we in this proof here? Oh yeah, we're finally here. And we said that we could factor. And so if I factor that stuff, I get Z1, absolute value of Z1, plus the absolute value of Z2 quantity squared. Now let's recap, and we just trudged through a lot of math. And so to put it all together as a recap, right? We started up there and on the left side, we had the absolute value of Z1 plus Z2 quantity squared. And where we ended at the end of all of this is finally that that's less than or equal to the absolute value of Z1 plus the absolute value of Z2 all squared. And now the last thing to do to finish this part off is just take the square root of both sides. And we obtained the triangle inequality in all of its glory. Fantastic. That wasn't too hard. Let's look at part B. Part B, so what is part B? I should remind you of that. Part B, again, sometimes goes by the name the reverse triangle inequality. So observe absolute value of Z1. We're gonna do something else that's sneaky that mathematicians like to do. We're going to add zero in a sneaky way. And I'm gonna add zero inside. And I've added zero by adding minus Z2 plus Z2. So these are the same. But now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use all the hard work that we did in part A and invoke it here. I'm gonna say that that's less than or equal to the absolute value of the first two guys, Z1 minus Z2, plus the absolute value of the second one. And so again, that's by the kind of standard or traditional triangle inequality. And just to recap, just so we, we have our inequality that we want, but maybe it's all on one line, so it's a little bit easier to see the algebra that I'm about to do. So the absolute value of Z1 is less than or equal to these two guys. Let's just subtract the absolute value of Z2 over to the left side. And so I'll do that here. And then when I move that over, I just get exactly what I wanted. I get the reverse triangle inequality. So again, that one was a little bit slicker where we added zero in a nice way, but then used the regular triangle inequality to do all the heavy lifting for us. So at the very end, we just had a little bit of algebra to do.